Good evening to you, to those in Europe or in Asia. Probably good morning to you, to those of you joining us from the Americas. Um, quick introduction. My name is Chris Angel. I am a member of Yamaha's Global Application Engineering Support Team, based here in the UK. Um, I am joined today by a couple of colleagues of mine who I'd just like to point out. Um, they are loitering in the background with the intent of answering some of your questions. Um, we have Andy Cooper, and joining us from Paris, we have Delphine. Okay, let's get cracking. So, what are we here to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about Yamaha's wireless mixing solutions for our ranges of digital mixing consoles. We will focus on two apps, um, Stage Mix and Monitor Mix. And just to give you a quick rundown of what we're going to cover, here is the basic agenda for you. We will start by introducing the apps and what they are intended to be used for. I will go over the basics of getting the apps online and synced to your consoles. And then I will give a live demonstration of our iPad of the apps, including some nice little tricks, tips, and shortcuts, which you may find useful for improving your mixing workflows. Um, then towards the end, I will go over some best network setup practices, including how to maintain the best and most stable Wi-Fi network. And if we have any time there at the end, I will do some live answers to your questions that you will have posted. And because Delphine is based in Paris, it means we have a French speaker with us. So if there are any viewers joining us um, who are French speakers and you would prefer to post a question in French, please do go ahead. Delphine will be able to answer them for you. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Right, so let's start with Stage Mix apps. These were developed for iPads and they were originally intended to give, um, in the early days, to give monitor engineers the freedom to be able to get away from being tied to the monitor console getting up there on stage with an iPad wirelessly and being able to actually listen to wedge mixes on stage from the perspective of the musicians and be able to make um, changes there and then. Um, over time, the apps have evolved quite greatly to now give control over the vast majority of the audio parameters of the console. Um, it's not quite everything but it is still the vast majority of them. So this makes it perfect now for, especially when consoles are placed in suboptimal mix positions, which can be quite often, unfortunately, whether you have to mix from the side of the room, maybe from side of stage, you can now wander into a better position and use your iPad to listen in the best spot. Um, this is a common question we often get, how many devices can I use and can be connected to any one console at a time? Yes, you can do more than one. It varies depending on the model of console you are using. So to give you a quick rundown, QL and CL can both accept up to four simultaneous stage mix connections at any one time, plus an editor connection for that matter. TF will allow you to do up to three stage mix connections, although if you are using an editor connection, that will drop down to two. And Rivage Stage Mix will allow you to do two simultaneous connections. Um, one point of difference I just want to make for these apps compared to the editors, which we have for all of these consoles, the, intended to, the editors are intended to be used both offline and online. Stage Mix is for online operation only. It will always synchronize to the current console parameters and the current scene. Um, they are also not there for really setting up the console. You can't do offline setup because they're online only, but also your console preferences, etc. For the most part, it does not affect those. There are, no, there are a few exceptions to that, which I will cover. Okay, and to give you an example of how stage mix is routinely used, you're seeing there, maybe you can see in the background of that picture, the console is hard up against the speaker stacks. Not a great mix position, so stage mix is perfect for a situation like this. Grab your iPad, wander to a better listening position, and mix far more freely. Okay, the second app we're gonna talk about briefly is what we call monitor mix. Now this is for smartphones, so of course it can also be used on an iPad. This app is rather different. It's not really for sound engineers at all. It is intended for musicians, so they can gain basic control over 
their own personal monitor mix using their own personal device. Um, this is available for both iOS and Android devices in this case. And it focuses on remote control of one single selected set of mix end levels and pan, and of course the master level fader of that selected mix. And again, because it's intended for band musicians, simultaneous connections are possible. In this case, up to 10, 10 devices can be used. And the app is perfect for say, house of worship musicians, church musicians, maybe theater musicians, even a gigging band, a small gigging band who would prefer to handle their own monitor mixes um, using their own devices. One question I do quite often get asked about monitor mix and the same for stage mix is, can I plug in my headphones into the phone or tablet and hear my monitor mix? No, is the answer to that. These apps are for control. Uh, and then people inevitably ask, well, why is that? It seems pretty obvious I should be able to do that. Well, again, you're about ahead of yourselves. Wi-Fi is just not a suitable medium for the streaming of real-time, high-quality audio. Um, for start, Dante also doesn't work over Wi-Fi, and Stage Mix also connects to the control network port of the consoles. Okay. Let's talk about getting these devices connected to your Wi-Fi networks. Um, the first stage is, of course, is to set an IP address for the network control on your consoles. That's a pretty straightforward thing to do. On a CL and QL, make sure you are using the, I have to check the name for myself now, make sure you're using the mixer control IP address. That is what is required for stage mix and editor connections and also for monitor mix. The for device control tab is for the console controlling other external um, devices, such as other stage boxes or wireless microphone receivers. You do not want that IP address for stage mix and for the editors and monitor mix. Make sure you are using the mixer control IP address. And then in the network settings of your mobile device, um, select your Wi-Fi network. And the best thing really here is to have what we call automatic setup or DHCP enabled um, on your mobile device. This means that the DHCP server will automatically assign all the um, necessary IP and subnet and router addresses which your device requires. Um, you don't have to use automatic, of course, you can also assign this manually if you want, although do, and especially in the case of iOS devices, make sure you enter an address for both the router and the DNS. Generally, this would be the IP address of your wireless access point. Um, you don't actually need an internet connection at all for using these apps, but in the case of iOS devices, they kind of need to be tricked, rather. It's not quite the right term, but they need to think that there is an internet connection there present. Otherwise, they will not open the network port for apps such as Stage Mix to use. Um, over on the app side, there are a few differences into discovering um, the mixing consoles. TF and Rivage Stage Mix, as well as Monitor Mix, as I will show you in a moment, both use auto discovery to find any available consoles on the network. For CL and QL Stage Mix, they require manual IP address entry of your console's IP address. And I will come to that a little later. Okay, Monitor Mix. So, as I was saying, um, it follows the same network device setup as you would use for stage mix. Uses auto discovery to find any available consoles there on the network, nice and simple. It does feature a pin code lockout, um, which you set up nice and easily on the console itself. It's a four, four digit code. You can also disable it if you want. Simply gives you an extra layer of security. So a non-authorized device can be blocked from syncing to the console. And as I was saying earlier, these apps do not pass audio, they are for control. You would be using them typically with a wireless IEM system or with a distributed headphone system. Okay, and this is the point where I try to get the iPad online. Bear with me, John, a moment. Well, I mirror my iPad screen. There we go, and hopefully now you will be able to see this, and I am going to go and select Monitor Mix. And that is it, up and running. 
And today I have a CL3 here with me. It is automatically discovered on the network. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit connect. The next thing that will pop up is what um, mix ends do I want to control? And today I'm simply going to select mix one and two and hit done. And that is it. Mix one is now controllable um, here from Monitor Mix. Um, to give you a brief layout of how this all works. So over here, on the right hand side, I have a master level control. This is, in this case, the uh, master faders for mixes one and two. So that would be your output master level. And then scrollable left to right here in the middle, we have all the mix end levels for mixes one and two for all of the channels of the console. As you can see, we're using a CR3 today. So that is a total, I think, of 64 plus eight stereo channels. It's quite a lot. Um, it's a lot for your average musician to handle. So there are some uh, tricks and tips I will go over to how to reduce down the number of faders to a more manageable level. Okay, you can also control the pan if necessary from up here in the top left hand corner. In this case, it's a stereo mix. If it's a mono mix, that pan option would naturally not be available. Let's go back to the levels. You don't have to grab the fader cap here. You can grab further down if necessary or above if necessary to move the faders. Anywhere along that fader strip will give you control of it. Down here at the bottom in the name area, of course it inherits the name, the color and the icon that you've assigned to that channel on the mixing console, but it's also the on off button. So if you press and hold in that area, you will be turning off the mix ends for those channels. So channels can be easily turned off from the app itself. Now today I'm using an iPad, so I've got a nice big screen, but say I'm using a much smaller device, a smaller phone, and I, it's a little bit too tight, I have too many faders there. Well in the settings, this cogwheel up in the top right hand corner, I can reduce the number of faders on display. So let's reduce it to five. And you will see now I have just five larger faders, a bit easier to grab on a smaller device. And I can still scroll through them, of course. Okay, now I have a few other tips to um, your layout on this. So let's go to these, uh, what we call the group and order icon up here again in the top right hand button. Top right hand corner rather. Now in here, a musician can freely reorder the, the, all the faders to whatever makes sense for them. Things can be moved about however you wish. So simply grab, in this case, it's gonna be channel four, and I'm gonna move that down to be on the first fader, for example. Um, Let's move, in this case, channel three and put that next to it. So now when I hit done and re return to the main view, you will see channel three and four have moved down. Let's go back to that same view because there's another nice little trick in here, which is what we call channel grouping. By simply tapping on each channel that you wish, you'll see the tick button appearing at the top and hitting group. You can now name that group. Let's just call it drums and hit done. I can also change the color and the icon if I wish. And now go to done. You'll see most of my drum channels, not all of them, but most of them have disappeared down into one easily controllable master group fader. It's effectively a DCA fader now for most of the drum channels. I can still access the individual ones simply by pressing underneath the master one. I can turn them all off if I wanted to from underneath. There we go, and turn them all back on. So I can sort of adjust the put each individual fader in turn, and I can easily fold them back up to access the other faders. Okay, that is basically it for Monitor Mix. Let's get out of here and return to the PowerPoint. Bear with me for one moment, please. Okay. So moving on, which is to stage mix. Okay, getting stage mix online. So there are two separate ways of doing this. Like monitor mix for TS stage mix and Rivage stage mix, they rely on auto discovery. So the consoles will be discovered automatically. You simply select them on the list, assuming that console is on the network in the correct range as your iPad. For CL and QL, you need to manually enter that console IP address into the app, as this screenshot here shows. Um, underneath that, here, you will see the console IP address, which is the IP address at that point in time of your iPad. Now, if the console IP address and the IP address of the console you have entered 
are compatible, i.e. they are in the same range, you will see this nice big green tick here off to the side to tell you your IP addresses are compatible, the mixer should be found and should be connected to. If you see a red cross, then you've got an error there in your IP addressing. One of your devices is out of range and you are going to have to edit the IP addresses accordingly. The green tick does not mean the device is discovered, it simply means that the IP address ranges are correct um, and when you hit connect it should be found. Okay and this is what you will see depending on the range of console you are using. On the left hand side we have a layout for CL and QL and on the right hand side we have the basic layout for both TF and Rivage stage mix. There are a few little differences with Rivage but for the most part it looks very similar to what you are seeing there. Okay at this point in time is where we get online here with my CL3 using stage mix. Bear with me one moment. Okay, and let's get some audio here running. Okay, and I started our multi track, which is running off Cubase and DVS into my CR3. And let's just give you a rundown here of what you are seeing and what you can do with Stage Mix. So at the top, we have what we call the meter bridge, which also doubles as showing all the fader levels and is the main navigational tool to mix between blocks of eight channels at a time. The left hand side is primarily dedicated to input channels. You can swap between layers using the layer buttons there in the middle. And the right hand side is mostly dedicated to output channels. As you go to custom layer, you can still put in input channels here on the right hand side. Um, but in the two standard layers, the right hand side is dedicated to your outputs and your masters there on the far right hand side. Um, above the faders, you will see these eight small thumbnails. These will give you quick access both to view and then to edit um, various the key um, parameters of the console. In this case, we're looking at EQs. And by tapping on the arrows over here on the left hand side, I can see the pan, I can see the dynamics, mix end levels and back to EQ. Um, you will notice these little dots here beneath these two channels one and two. This basically means that you have some additional EQ here inserted on the channel. So if you drag here from right to left over this channel I will access the GEQ which has been assigned to this channel or rather inserted on this channel. Um, there's a second dot here as well so I will drag over it again from right to left and I'll access in this case what is a PEQ8. Let's enter that for a moment and you'll see I have an eight band EQ here. Okay, so that is your EQ interface. It's pretty self-explanatory. Drag as you wish. Pan, con uh, sorry, Q control is to use a double fingered pinch motion. Nice and simple. And you can move here at the bottom using the tabs between the various parameters. This is back to the main channel EQ, the dynamics. So if I now edit up, uh, sorry, ink up a couple of channels using these arrow buttons down in the lower right hand corner, you'll see these inserts disappear. That is because there are no inserts on these two channels, so they are gone. Simple as that. Now say I want to navigate now direct to an output channel and I don't want to go back to the mixer view. That can be easily done. Just press and hold on the arrow keys and you will get a little grid here of all the channels on the console. So in this case, I'm going to go straight to matrix eight. Done. Simple as that. No need to go back to the main view and back again. That's simply a press and hold on these arrow buttons. Okay, let's return to the mixer view. One thing to bear in mind, of course, the iPad is a multi-touch display, so I can control, in this case, up to four faders with four fingers, if you can contort your hand in such a way, but four faders are controllable at any one point in time. You don't have to be limited just to one. Okay, let's run down here on the left-hand side and go to the setup menu, because there are a few interesting points in here that you will need to know about, depending on how you want to use stage mix. Um, I'm going to draw your attention over here to the what we call the channel select functions. And let's just turn them both off. So as you know, Yamaha consoles have um, a selected channel concept, and so does stage mix. Now perhaps if you've got the EQ window open on stage mix and you select a new channel on the console, you want stage mix to jump to that channel, in which case you would turn on this first option here at the top. 
And having said that, perhaps you, if you want to select a new channel in Stage Mix and you want the console to follow that selected channel selection, then you would simply turn on that second setting. Nice and simple. Okay, metering points below. These are set independently of the console. So bear in mind, you may be looking at different metering points if you're not, if you're not so careful. Uh, makes more sense to have them both to be the same, but they, they can be set differently should you so wish. RTA, the real time analyzer. This can be viewed in any of the EQ screens. This uses the built-in iPad microphone. Um, so it's not super high quality. It's just intended as a quick tool to allow you to easily identify any problematic feedback in frequencies. It's certainly no substitute for a professional RTA tool such as Smart or SpectraFu, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you'll see down here in the bottom left-hand corner, a few grayed out controls. Um, these are because these will only become active if you have QB mode enabled in the monitor section of your console. Um, for those of you who don't know, QB mode will turn matrix seven and eight into a separate Q bus. So if you happen to be using both wedges and in-ears and you need to use two separate Q buses, this is a quick and easy way of doing it. And then some of these controls in stage mix would become active. Um, one key point to know about if you are using QB mode is the operational mode. You'll see these two icons here of channel and remote. Again, this can be set from the console if necessary as well, but you can also change it in stage mix. If you select remote mode, QB is dedicated to the iPad. So perhaps a second operator can be selecting their cues independently of the operator on the channel, on the console rather, and the guy on the console, they would only be using QA. If you've had it set to channel, then it depends on the queue assignment which is set per channel. And there's a solo in place as well, can be toggled on and off there at the bottom. Okay, that's the setup menu. Let's get out of there and see what else here we can talk about. Okay, sends on faders. Typical requirement that is often needed that is accessed through this large button here on the left hand side. Um, the last selected mix in this case was mix one and two, same as we were using a monitor mix earlier. So now all the meter bridge across the top is now all the sends on fader, um, faders for that selected mix send. Now I can change the um, selected mix by simply tapping on that button and opening a table and I can jump across say to mix 17. You don't have to open that window. If you drag left or right over this button, you can toggle up or down the mixes nice and quickly. Very convenient way of doing this with your thumb there on, on the left hand side. Okay, this bar across the top tells, um, lets you know the selected output mix information. You can toggle the level of that mix up and down using the arrow buttons there. Of course, you can cue it, turn it off, adjust the balance of it. You can route it to stereo or mono masters if necessary. And then you can see the EQ, the dynamics, and these two bo blocks are blank, again, because there are no inserted GEQs or PEQs at eight in it. If I have a graphic EQ inserted on this mix output, it would be viewable here and either insert A or B. Um, and if it's a stereo mix, let's go back to a stereo mix. There will of course be pans that is accessed by tapping the arrow button up there. And now I have the mix send pans per channel. Okay, a few other things to know about in mix ends view are the pre buttons here above the faders. Of course, if I can press each one individually to toggle it between post fade and pre fade. But say I'm setting up the console and I want to change a whole group of faders to be um, a whole group of sends to be pre fade at one time without having to do them independently. Very simple in stage mix, press and hold on any of those P buttons and you'll get a little menu to pop up. So now I want to change all the channels for this mix bus one and two to be pre for all channels. So I'm just going to press that here, confirm it, and you will see all the, all the um, pre buttons have now toggled on. A quick way of now to speed up your console setup. Okay, let's go back to the mixer view here. So turn off sends on faders for a moment. Okay, gain view here at the bottom on the bottom left hand corner. Okay, so I'm using DBS at the moment and my audio has stopped. Let's get that running again. So there are no head amps in view today, but if I was patched um, over Dante to some Rios then I would be seeing gain faders here. You can of course still see your digital gain faders by hitting the digital gain button. Let's turn that off and return to 
and the main game view, which are coloured here in red. Um, above the faders or the red strip here, you will see your input patch selection. Now this can be edited from Stage Mix. Double tap on that to bring up the patch view. So you see along here at the bottom, the various patch groups, the, the, the type of ports, your Dante inputs, your Omni inputs, your MY slot ins, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you can navigate up through your channels from here. And again, pressing and hold will let you jump across to any other channel that you wish. Now there's a few nice little tricks and tips here in the patch view, which I'm going to talk about now, which are mostly accessed through this options tab button rather in the top left hand corner. So let's press on that to open up what we can do here. Head amp info, this is the same um, preference that you can set on the console. What it means is where are you taking your current head amp value from? Are you going to inherit it from the port that you are about to patch to? Or do you want to send the current head amp value of the channel that you are working on to a new head amp? Again, that can be set on the console. Underneath this, we have a couple of interesting things here, which is port ID and Dante name. So let's change this to Dante name. Um, these are the channel labels or the channel name that you can set in Dante controller. And these are now viewable here in the app. So if you look down here at the bottom on um, Dante ports 57 to 64, I have set up some Dante names using Dante controller. These are the transmit names in this case of DVS. Now, say you spent a bit of time labeling all the ports on your stage boxes, and now you're like, ooh, now I need to label all the channels here on the console. You can, of course, do that in Stage Mix by simply double tapping on the channel name there at the bottom. Let's just close that. That was double tapping down here underneath the faders. Let's go back to the patch for a second. But there's a shortcut in Stage Mix which allows you to send those Dante names to the console. And that's up here in the patch options again. You'll see it here. Dante names two channels. So I'm simply going to select that in this case. You'll see this will copy the names over to the um, to the channels. Hit confirm. And the ones for that I had set in this case it was channels um, 57 upwards. You'll see the channel names have now changed to those Dante port names. If you do that, remember to store your scene, because if you suddenly change your scene, those names will revert back to what they previously were. And let's go back to that patch view at the moment. There's another neat little trick here that I would like to talk to you about. Um, say you need to regularly change the input patch of your console, and you have to do it channel by channel. A little bit tedious. Well, there's a nice little shortcut here in Stage Mix, which will allow you to do a whole run of patches across some simultaneous channels in one operation. So I'm here on channel 57 and let's change it to be an Omni input of the console. Now I'm going to press and hold here on Omni 1 as the starting point of my patch. So you're, it brings up what we call the multi-channel patching menu. So I'm going to select the next eight channels. I want these to be patched in simultaneous order using Omni inputs 1 to 8. So I've selected eight channels. And you will see here now, my new patch is going to start from channel 57 and it's going to end at channel 64. It's going to start from Omni 1, it's going to end at Omni 8. I'm now going to hit set, confirm it. And now if I toggle through these channels, that patch has occurred just in one operation, nice and quick. Okay, let's get out of there. Ah, now you might have seen something interesting. So because I've patched across to Omni inputs, my head amp faders have appeared. Now these head amp faders don't necessarily have to be an Omni input or even a Yamaha Rio Dante input device. Yamaha consoles um, have control over a few other manufacturers' stage boxes, such as Focusrite RedNet devices, such as a Rupert Knees device, um, input device, an eight channel Dante device, and even Stage Tech Nexus. Head amps. They can all be controlled from the console. And if they are correctly assigned to the console, then I can quite easily control them from Stage Mix as well. Now, the next point here, you'll see these RF buttons have appeared. What are those? Well, I will tell you. This means that those channels have a wireless mic receiver assigned to them. So I'm simply going to touch on them to open up the view. 
And I just so happen to have one mic device just here. I'm just going to turn on the transmitter. There we go. Give it a few moments and all the data will start to filter through. So these devices, which um, come can be a selection from either Shaw and um, Sennheiser and also from Sony, if they are correctly mounted on the console, you can view them in Stage Mix. Um, one device from Shaw especially is currently not controllable from Stage Mix, but soon will be, is the Shaw Accident Digital. That will be coming soon, I am told. But for now, I'm using a Shure ULXD device. Um, in the case of Accent Digital, it also has what Shure calls a quality meter. This can be accessed by tapping here on the diversity meter, and you'll be able to access the quality meter. Underneath, we have the receiver gain fader of the wireless device. Now, some devices don't just have receiver output gain. They also have, in some cases, a transmitter gain. So in the second one, I can toggle to the transmitter gain. I don't have the physical device, which is why it is currently blank. Um, but if there is a transmitter gain controllable, it will appear with TX is there. OK, let's get out of the gain page. Custom faders. Let's talk a little bit about the custom fader layer in station mix. Now you will see it is blank and my meter bridge at the moment is completely blank as well. Okay, now how do you assign um, fader blocks to this? Well, as it tells you there, it's a case of tap and hold on any block you wish, and it will open up this assignment view for you to put whatever you want where you want it. So in this case, I'm gonna put it mix one to eight in that layer, hit the arrow buttons above it, to change block and let's put channels 48, 41 to 48 over there. Um, now let's go to the blocks on the left hand side. You'll see at the moment they are blank, but there is actually actually a layer assigned there. It is block A1, 1 to 8, but just so happens that nothing is assigned on the console. So bear with me one moment. I'm just going to go over to the console and assign some faders and you will see them appearing here in Stage Mix. Well, you would if I had the right block assigned. There it is. Those four faders have appeared. Um, so Stage Mix here follows the assignment that you have made on the console. Further to that, you can also name them. If you simply double tap on that block, it will bring up a keyboard. Let's call this block of eight channels drums. And there we go. You will see the name has appeared rather than just a rather boring channel ID range. So you can now customize it and name them to your heart's content. Now the meter bridge um, assignments and the block names are all stored with the mixer IP address that you would have created when you first connected to the console. So you can return to these same settings next time simply by connecting to that same console IP address. Okay. Now, there are some differences for the custom fader layer in TF stage mix. So I'm going to go to TF. In this case, I am offline. I do not have a TF or a PM Avage device here today. Now, we can get to the custom fader layer assignment view by hitting the setup button. Nope, I stand corrected. Hit the utility button and then hit here the custom fader button. Now, in TS Stage Mix and Revised Stage Mix, you can create your own independent custom fader layer independently of the console. So you'll hear, see here at the moment, fader one is a DCA. And let's go to fader two, and let's call that aux 9 and 10. Let's go to fader three, and let's call that, in this case, the, the monitor output fader. Now, if you don't want to be doing that and you want to be using the same custom fader layer assignments of the console, don't worry, you can do that too. Go down here to the bottom right hand corner and this arrow, press that and it slides out what we call the context bar. And you will see here an import button. Tap that and Stage Mix will go away and ask the console for its current custom fader assignments and put them there into Stage Mix. Okay, let's go out of this. Return to the main mixer view. Now, how to view the custom fader layer here in 
um, TF and VARS stage mix because we do not have the layer buttons. We'll go to the meter bridge and there's two ways. Simply press and hold, should you prefer, and you can enable the custom fader layer that way. So actually, I was already in it. You can see down here, I have a DCA fader and the monitor faders that I assigned earlier. There's also another way of accessing, swapping between the base layers and the custom fader layer. And that is simply to swipe upwards on the meter bridge, which I am now doing, and it will toggle backwards and forwards between the base layers and the custom fader layers. All right, that is a very quick rundown of what it is that you can do with Stage Mix. I am now going to return to the PowerPoint and move on with the next part. One moment, please. Okay. Okay, so this part is all about how to maintain a good stable Wi-Fi network. Um, this is very, very important if you want to keep a stable connected um, device without constant dropouts. Um, one question I get asked a lot is, I need a router. No, you don't. You need a wireless access point. There is no need for a router unless you specifically need it for another purpose. Um, most people will connect it direct to the network control port on the rear of the console. Um, of course, you don't need to do that. You can connect it via a switch to a wider LAN, should you so wish. No problem with that whatsoever. It can even be used on the same network or VLAN that you happen to be using for Dante Audio. Um, but if you do that, you will need to take a little bit of care of your multicast data management. But it can certainly be done. But having said that, for ease of use and easier troubleshooting, I would recommend that you keep Dante Audio and console control data on separate VLANs for just for easier management. Um, last but not least, now I go over this in more detail a little bit later, you can use a wide Ethernet connection should you prefer. There's a choice of network adapters you can use for that. Okay, network security. Of course you need network security. At a gig, there could easily be hundreds, thousands of personal devices out there all constantly sniffing for a Wi-Fi network. Well, you don't want them joining your console control network, believe me. So make sure you are using a high-grade option for Wi-Fi security. Um, WPA3 is the latest and the greatest, supposedly. And that is probably the best one to be going for. Further to that, there are a few other tricks you can use to discourage unauthorized devices from joining your network. One of them is what we call hiding the service set identifier, the network name of your Wi-Fi network. This used to be quite a good thing to do, but actually recently with iOS devices especially, as well as some Android devices, they become increasingly grumpy about this. Um, you might return to that network the same day, the next day, and that device will no longer connect to it. So actually in this day and age, I would suggest don't use the um, hiding the network name. Please leave it enabled. It will make your life a little bit easier. However, there is another better way, which is listed there, which is device MAC address filtering. This means you will go to your wireless access point and register the MAC addresses of your devices. And when that device comes to connect to the network, it will be referenced against that list in the wireless access point. If that MAC address is not present, that device will not be able to join that network, even if it knows the security password of it. Also, keep your wireless access point firmware up to date. A lot of people miss out on that, but it's quite common for when you actually um, go out there and see whether there's any new firmware. Oh, well, look, there's half a dozen updates coming quite regularly. So look out for that. It's quite an important thing to do to maintain the security of your network. Okay, how to actually use Wi-Fi. Well, most people will use what we call the 2.4 gigahertz band. There's also the five gig band. These are the two license-free RS spectrum bands which Wi-Fi uses. However, because they are license-free, everyone wants to use them. And there may be all manner of other devices using exactly that same um, RF spectrum. Also, in the 2.4 gig range, there may be 12, 13, 14 channels available, but check out that image underneath. You will see here that most of those Wi-Fi channels are actually overlapping with each other. So just because you think, oh, channel two has got something on it, um, I will use channel one. Mm -mm. A big part of that spectrum, 22 megahertz of it to be precise, are actually overlapping. So actually at 2.4 gig, there's very few number of channels that you can realistically use, the best ones being 1, 6, and 11. 
Um, now, you may look at that and go, great, I use Channel 14. Well, actually, in some regions, it depends where you are in the world, but actually Channel 14 is not part of the free Wi-Fi spectrum in quite a few countries. So you will not find it actually on your access point. OK, so what you really want is a dual band access point that can also manage five gig. And you'll look at this diagram here, you will see there are far more non-overlapping channels available at five gig. So it makes a lot more sense, don't you think, to go to five gig. However, if only it was that simple, in reality it isn't. There might be more free spectrum available for usage up there, but there are some disadvantages of using five gig. For start, some devices may not be compatible with five gig. It will give you lower range because of the shorter wavelengths, it will give you quite substantially a shorter range than 2.4 gig. On the plus side, as I was saying, many more non-overlapping channels and less Wi-Fi congestion typically, though it is beginning to fill up in some places. Um, having said that, 2.4 gig because of those, sorry, 5 gig because of those shorter wavelengths will be more susceptible to physical interference from walls, metal, etc. 2.4 gig is better at dealing with physical barriers. Okay, another thing to think about is how you actually position your antenna. So many people just put their wireless access point there in the dog box of the console and just go, great, that will do. Not really. Um, human us, human bodies, just as with radio microphones, we are great at absorbing RF. So you want to get your antennas up high, above head height ideally, and to be able to keep a good line of sight to the mobile devices. Also consider the physical area that you are covering, just as you would with radio microphones, there are different types of antennas available with wireless access points. You may want to consider a directional antenna. Most um, access points will come with omnidirectional antennas, but it may make more sense for you, for you to find some detachable directional antennas or find a access point which has a built-in directional antenna which you can mount up high on a pole. That's the best way of doing it. Um, some people seem to think, ah, great, I can use high gain antennas or boost the um, transmit power of my access point using some hacked firmware. That doesn't really work because um, Wi-Fi is bi-directional. So it needs to receive back from the iPad and there's nothing much you can do to boost the transmit power of your iPad. Okay, so just to summarize quickly, ah, a few other points first. Consider how many wireless clients, how many wireless devices there are going to be on your network. Lower cost um, access points, which are primarily intended for home domestic usage, they're not gonna be so good at dealing with multiple devices on that network. Um, so if you're having lots and lots of devices, it might be worth looking at using an enterprise grade access point instead. Remember that the RF spectrum usage is, is always changing. You may have set your access point to be auto channel selection, to jump around when a channel becomes congested to a free one. Um, in our experience, they're not so good at this. Quite often, they, you turn this on and they will not change, or they will change very, very slowly, by which it's time it's too late. Um, you, you're experiencing dropouts because another device has jumped to your channel. So it's important on a daily basis to actually scan the Wi-Fi spectrum. And here you will see an image from one of the better uh, Wi-Fi scanning software, which is available for both Mac and PC, it's called Insider. Um, it's well worth taking a little, a little look at. But one problem with such um, pieces of software, of course, they are only scanning for Wi-Fi devices. They are not gonna tell you what other non-Wi-Fi devices may be using some of that spectrum. So at that point in time, you need to be turning to some professional RS scanning um, devices to help you out. So regularly check your Wi-Fi environment to see what is changing, sometimes even on an hour to hour basis. Um, and if you are in a bit more of a complex installation, perhaps using multiple routed subnets, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, or multiple Wi-Fi access points, at that point you probably would be worth consulting a professional for further advice. And if all else fails, well in Pro Audio there's a pretty typical rule which is a wire is always better. Um, so if you don't need to leave the console, you, you just want to use it as a second screen, well, you don't have to use a wireless access point at all. Um, using a couple of Ethernet dongles, you can connect directly to the console. So if you're using an iPad Pro, that is simply a USB-C to Ethernet adapter, plug it straight on in, it will be powered off the battery. 
but that does mean your battery level may drain a little bit more quickly than it otherwise would. Um, if you're using an iPad with a lightning port, then as this diagram here suggests, you actually need two dongles. First is a USB to, uh, sorry, a lightning to USB um, camera adapter kit. And then into the USB port, you will plug a USB to ethernet adapter. Um, and from that, you would go to your ethernet network. However, on the other side of things here, you, that does need to be powered. The iPad will not power that combination of adapters. So you end up with something like this picture I'll we'll show you here. This here is a power cable off an iPad power supply, which is required to make this combination of things work. Okay, let's get this just about closed up now. Um, just to let you know about a few other wireless device apps which Yamaha has available, which is the Provisionaire range of applications. These are to create custom control panels. So if you're mostly in an installation and perhaps you have some unskilled operators present and you only want to give them access to certain parameters of your console, well, this is one solution to you. You can create some very simple panels as shown here. On the other hand of things, I've seen some remarkably complex panels being created using this software. Um, two versions of it, the main editing version, and also what we call the kiosk version, which removes the ability to edit your panels. You only see the final panel with the parameters there. And further to that, we also have provisioner control available on Windows platforms, it does the same thing. You can even create your panels here on Windows and send them to iPad for deployment. Okay, that is pretty much us for today. Um, should you have any further requirements for education during these troubling times, Yamaha has all manner of resources open to you. Check out our website and in particular the Audioversity section of it for all manner of content there. You can also look at our YouTube channel. We have quite literally dozens and dozens of training videos available to you there. Um, should you want to read a little bit more about Wi-Fi and how to set up good Wi-Fi networks, um, I would recommend going to the MetaGeek website. These are the same people who make that insider software, which I was referring to earlier. Their website is excellent, all manner of good training resource available there. Okay, I'm going to jump now to the Q&A, as that is the end of the presentation. Whoops, I've jumped ahead one too many. Now my colleagues here have left, uh, left a few open questions for me here that you have all sent in. Fred, will the uh, capability of adding the premium rack be added in the future? Um, sadly not, there's a protocol issue there and we will not be able to add the premium rack or the Dugan into the versions of Stage Mix. That's one of the parameter areas I was referring to earlier. Um, does Monitor Mix work with consoles like MLS9 or M7CL? Um, no, sorry to say that is not the case. Those mixing consoles now are pretty old. In the case of M7CL, that's ooh, 15 years old. It's at this point, those consoles are now discontinued for us and we will not be bringing apps to those type of things. Is it possible here to use two iPads with a mixer? Yes, it most certainly is. Um, as I suggested earlier, maybe you missed that moment. Um, CL and QL allow you to have four simultaneous iPad connections at any one time, TF up to three and Rivage PM10 7 um, will allow you up to two. Gareth, it would be really useful if we showed the battery charge state of the iPad during use. Ah, you're in luck. I believe the next update of Stage Mix will be giving you just that. Um, I'm not entirely sure when it will be released, but it will be relatively soon. It will also bring the, ac the sure accident digital control and monitoring to you. Okay. Unless there are any more questions there, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I hope you are all staying so safe and healthy in these rather problematic times. Thank you so much for joining us today. Like I say, you want any more training information from Yamaha, head to our website, head to our YouTube channel. Loads and loads of information available for you there. Okay, thank you very much again for joining us today. Bye now. <laughs>